Hi, my name is Chris Brennan, and this is your yearly horoscope forecast for the zodiac sign of Leo for the entire year ahead of 2022. If you're new to my channel, then my name is Chris Brennan, and I'm the host of the Astrology Podcast and the author of a book on ancient astrology titled Hellenistic Astrology, The Study of Fate and Fortune. So in my approach, I synthesize a little bit of ancient and a little bit of modern astrology in order to get the best of both worlds. So each week I release new podcasts and videos on astrology on my channel, so if you'd like to get notifications when I release a new video, then please hit the subscribe button here on YouTube, and if you enjoy this video, then please consider hitting the like button to show me that you enjoyed the content and you'd like to see more of it. Okay, so my horoscopes are primarily meant to be read relative to your rising sign or your ascendant sign, which are essentially the same things. Although you can also watch them from the perspective of your sun sign, especially if you're born during the day, or your moon sign, especially if you're born at night. So the rising sign changes signs every hour or two during the course of the day, whereas the moon sign takes about two days to change signs, and the sun sign takes about a month to change signs. So as a result of that, the rising sign is much more personally relevant to you, and for that reason, I would really focus on that when you're looking at these horoscopes, or horoscopes in general for that matter. So if you don't know what your rising sign is, then all you need to do is find out your birth time and then go to a website where you can get your birth chart calculated, such as astro.com, and you should be able to get your ascendant or your birth rising sign calculated on those websites. So I have a video tutorial titled How to Calculate Your Ascendant and Rising Sign on my channel, which you can either search for or, or I'll put a link to it in the upper corner of this video right here. So let me know in the comments below what your sun, moon, and rising signs are, and which sign resonates with you more when you watch your video horoscopes like this one. All right, Leo, let's get into it by looking at your transits for 2022. So here's an image that depicts where the planets will start at the beginning of the year and how far through the signs of the zodiac they'll end up by the end of the year. So the main transits I want to talk about are outlined on this slide, and we're going to start with the Venus retrograde in Capricorn in your sixth house of work and health, because even though that transit uh, started late last year in December, uh, it's going to continue on and still be relevant into early March as long as Venus is still transiting through Capricorn. So here's another slide that lists the dates and timeframes of some of the transits that I'm going to talk about, so you can refer back to that later in case you need a refresher and so I don't have to repeat the dates involved each time. All right, so uh, very first transit. Venus recently went retrograde and is about halfway through its retrograde cycle uh, in your sixth house of work and health in the sign of Capricorn. Uh, here's a diagram that shows the significations of the sixth house, especially from a traditional standpoint. So work and health are the two primary themes that come up usually when we get sixth house transits. So a Venus retrograde usually um, has us revisit and sometimes revise social relationships in the area of the chart that it's transiting. So for you, this could relate to uh, things happening in your workplace, things happening with subordinates if you find yourself in a managerial position, um, something about renegotiating some of the relationships that you have in the workplace and with those around you at work. So sometimes this can bring up things that happened or it can dredge up things from the past that happened eight years ago, since Venus goes retrograde in this sign of the zodiac approximately every eight years. So you can think back eight years or 16 years or 24 years or so on and so forth, depending on how old you are. And sometimes some of those themes will be relevant now that have happened in those past increments. So because Venus went retrograde conjunct Pluto at the start of this cycle, it may have started as a bit tricky. Um, Venus-Pluto conjunctions can have to do with uh, power plays or power struggles. So for you, that could be some sort of power struggle happening in the workplace or with some sort of workplace relationship. Um, it can also have to do not just with the workplace, but also with health matters and with things related to your body. So it may be that there's some 
um, health things that you have to revisit that perhaps you initiated or were instituted or became habits in the past. But for some reason now, you have to go back and look at some of those habits and see if they're really working for you or if there's something that's holding you back or causing problems that might be worth revising or revisiting at this time. So some of this transit is going to accelerate uh, when Mars goes into Capricorn in late January, because then it's going to join up with Venus. And when Mars goes into a sign that can have a tendency to speed things up, to add some fieriness to that area of our life, um, but also to sometimes um, make things a little bit more acute. So if there were any health issues that the Venus retrograde was starting to, to make you think about sort of slowly or gradually, um, the Mars ingress into Capricorn in late January could make some of those things a little bit more acute and a little bit more pressing so that you need to take decisive action. So if there's something comes that comes up, don't put it off, but instead try to address it. So those same uh, that same advice also applies if we're talking about sixth house workplace things. If there's some sort of workplace issue, then it's going to be more pressing to address starting in late January and going through until early March, uh, which is when Mars finally will depart from Capricorn along with Venus on the same day on March 6. So that is the first transit that I wanted to mention. The second transit to move to something more pop positive is Jupiter is going to ingress or has recently ingressed into Pisces and into your eighth house of other people's money, finances, inheritance, uh, sometimes debt. But generally speaking, Jupiter into the eighth house is usually a relatively positive transit for financial matters. And it could indicate some sort of sudden windfall coming from other people around you or other people in your life. So uh, sometimes this can be things like an unexpected um, bonus at work, uh, a tax break, or some sort of major tax refund. Um, since it's the eighth house, since the eighth is the second from the seventh house of partners, sometimes it can be just that your partner gets a raise or suddenly has. Um, an excess of income that was new or it was a surprise at this point. Um, one thing you want to be a little bit careful about is that in early April, Jupiter is going to conjoin Neptune in Pisces, which can sometimes be bring more of an illusory element to transits where sometimes something can seem too good to be true, and usually when it seems that way, it usually is. So that doesn't necessarily have to be a complete deal breaker, but it might be a good idea to be careful about entering into financial uh, agreements at this time and just make sure that everything is above board and there's no instances where you're potentially being led astray financially by somebody else. But as long as you're careful, it should be all right. That's just a piece of advice I wanted to give for those of you because Neptune transits can be a little bit dicey sometimes in terms of honesty and openness, or the potential at least in the worst case scenario for deception. Uh, but otherwise, that's a relatively positive uh, financial transit. Um, so moving on, that Jupiter transit through Pisces is only really going to last for the first four months of 2022. And eventually, starting in May, Jupiter is going to move into your ninth house of religion, education, beliefs, philosophy, travel, and interaction with foreign things, foreign cultures, and foreign people. So this can be a really great transit to um, start learning something new and to expand your horizons when it comes to just your not just your beliefs and your philosophy, but also your um, exposure to the world and your exposure to things that are different compared to what you grew up with, whatever your default setting is based on where you came from. So some people travel during this time, or they learn a new language, or they start uh, a new educational program, and something that will eventually build up and culminate once Jupiter later gets to your 10th house next year, which is the 10th house of career. 
So the ninth house is usually preparatory and it builds up to and gives you the necessary training to then achieve something once Jupiter goes into your 10th house. That's a terrible looking arrow that I just attempted to draw there. So I'm going to erase that. Um, so yeah, try to expand your horizons in terms of philosophy and education. Um, obviously, travel is kind of difficult during this time with the pandemic and everything, but there may be small ways that we can travel or small ways that we can expose ourselves to new things and learn new things that don't necessarily require us to physically go somewhere else. In some instances, ninth house transits involving Jupiter, which are all about growth and expansion, can indicate a ninth house figure or character coming into your life who teaches you something or opens up your horizons to some new perspective that you weren't aware of previously. So generally speaking, this is just a pretty favorable transit, and that's going to be most of the second and third quarter of the year for you. And then eventually Jupiter will retrograde out of Aries. It'll go back into Pisces for a little bit, and then it'll come back into Aries from December 20th through May 23rd of, or it's through May of 2023. So that'll be a transit that carries over into next year, and we'll just get part of it this year in 2022. All right, the next transit I wanted to talk about is Saturn is has now made its way into the second half of Aquarius, and thus the second half of your seventh house of relationships and partnership. So this is a transit that began uh, around March and April of 2020 when Saturn first dipped into Aquarius and into your seventh house of relationships. And Saturn can be kind of a challenging planet that sometimes brings up obstacles and difficulties and sometimes setbacks in whatever area of the chart it is transiting. So sometimes these obstacles and difficulties or setbacks can be sort of surmountable difficulties where something comes up and there's an obstacle, but you're able to, through much striving and effort on your part, uh, overcome the obstacle and you come out of it stronger uh, as a result. So that's one scenario during this time. The other scenario is that sometimes in our life we go down a certain path and Saturn puts up kind of a stop sign and says, you cannot proceed further on this path, and instead you have to go a different direction. And that can be kind of tough sometimes, but necessary because even though Saturn can kind of close one door, there'll be other doors that open if you just go in different directions. So one of the challenges for you is figuring out um, in what ways this period of consolidation and um, uh, sort of bringing things, having a little bit lower energy in this area of your life, whether this is like bringing up surmountable difficulties or whether you need to call it quits when it comes to certain relationships and certain partnerships in your life at this time. So for some people, this may coincide with a period of ending some major relationships if you've figured out that the relationship isn't what you want or you've sort of outgrown it at this time then it may be time for you to make an exit of some sort, hopefully gracefully. In other instances, there could be challenges that are coming up in the sphere of partnership or in romantic relationships, but if it's something that you really want to stick with and you think that it's worth working through, then it will just take a lot of effort during this time and hard work, um, but you may be able to persevere and get through it uh, as a couple. So this is going to become a little bit more acute in the second quarter, basically late in the first quarter and especially in the second quarter of 2023, because what's going to happen is Mars is actually going to ingress into the sign of Aquarius uh, in early March of 2023, and then it's going to come up and form a conjunction with Saturn around April 4th and 5th before eventually Mars um, will leave that sign and move into Pisces uh, after about a, a month of that transit by mid-April. So Mars can sometimes, as I said earlier, speed things up so that the pace of events when it comes to relationships and partnership for you increases and you're, you're having to put more energy into relationships during that one-month period. 
but also it can sometimes bring things to a boil or bring things to a head in terms of if there are issues in your relationships, they'll probably become more acute during this time and probably force you to address them more directly and more decisively than you have previously. So sometimes Mars-Saturn conjunctions can cause a lot of tension or make us feel like we're being pulled in two different directions, which can be really tense and difficult to deal with. But ultimately, the goal is to sort of force you to make hard decisions. And once you make those decisions, then you can begin moving forward again eventually after a period that feels very slow or feels like there was a lot of stagnation. So if you're feeling this during that one month period around the time of the conjunction, especially, just know that it's temporary and eventually you'll get through it and come out the other side after, after a month or so. So the Saturn transit, though, through Aquarius um, is pretty much over by early 2023. So Saturn moves out of Aquarius and it will move into the sign of Pisces in March of 2023. So it's going to move out of your seventh house completely by that time and move into your eighth house. So some of whatever the potential relationship challenges is that you may or may not be dealing with when it comes to Saturn transiting through Aquarius, um, the good news is that most of that energy should be over by the time Saturn moves into Pisces early next year. So you're in the home stretch now, and I think that's something to be optimistic about in terms of most of what this transit should be about for you should have already started to become clear over the course of the past year. And at this point, you're just sort of going through the motions, or you just have to bunker down and push through the very last phase of it before you come out on the other side. All right, so related to that, um, Saturn is going to be forming another square with Uranus this year, especially between September and October. So we already had three exact Saturn-Uranus squares over the course of 2021, and that was really the main signature during the course of 2021. But as we can see from the Archetypal Explorer graph here, that square comes back around the third quarter of 2023 and becomes very close, even though it doesn't go exact. So this has to do with Uranus, which is transiting through your 10th house of career, and it has been for the past few years, squaring Saturn in your 7th house of relationships and causing some tension between those two. So Uranus tends to be more of a unstable, destabilizing, sort of revolutionary energy that's going through your 10th house of career, and it may be feeling very liberating where you've been striking out over the past few years on new career directions and trying to achieve new goals and sometimes having radical or very rapid changes in terms of your career aspirations and your overall life direction. But for some reason, this may be causing some tension um, between the career sector and your relationships. And this is going to be a theme that should have already manifested to some extent in 2021, but we'll probably see a return to that in the third quarter here when that Saturn-Uranus square gets close to going exact again. This actually brings us to one of the next, the second to last thing that I wanted to mention that will actually emphasize that square, and especially the Uranus transit through your 10th house of career a bit, which is that this year we're going to have two sets of eclipses, of solar and lunar eclipses in Taurus and Scorpio. So this is taking place in your 10th house of career, as well as your fourth house of the home and the family, the living situation, and your private life. So here is those four eclipses. So the first one is in Taurus in late April, then the Scorpio one is in mid-May. Then we have another set where there's a Scorpio one in late October in your fourth house, and then a Taurus eclipse in early November in your 10th house of career. So that means that we're going to have eclipses basically bouncing back and forth this year between your 10th house of career and your fourth house of home, family, and living situation. So my keyword for eclipses is major beginnings and major endings. So you should be having a period of major beginnings and major endings when it comes to career matters in your public life and overall life direction, as well as when it comes to your private life, your living situation 
And in some instances, with respect to your relationship with your family or your parents in particular, since usually the par- a person's parents are indicated or sometimes an- ancestry is indicated by the fourth house. So for some people, a major beginning or ending in the fourth house could have to do with moving or some sort of major situation of relocating when it comes to your home and living situation. In other instances, it could be something that relates to um, your mom or your dad or whatever your family sort of parental figure was growing up um, and something happening in their life. So that's the fourth house stuff. The tenth house stuff, though, seems like it's really emphasizing some of these career changes that have been happening with Uranus over the past few years and shining more of a spotlight on that where maybe some of the inklings of major radical changes that Uranus has been indicating in the background really start to come to the forefront of your life at this time. Um, Especially, there's two eclipses that are very close to Uranus, actually, that that happened this year. I think one of them is the one that happens in November, uh, close to the US presidential election. But that's really going to amplify the Uranus energy of sort of instability, but also wanting to seek freedom and change And sometimes just um, the impulse to tear everything down and to start over again new is a very Uranian feeling. So sometimes this can be constructive and necessary to sort of tear everything down and start over again or to make radical changes very rapidly when it comes to your career and your overall life direction. Um, Just make sure that you are doing it constructively and you're not just making change for the sake of change that's sort of senseless and destructive which can sometimes be a Uranian tendency of just like total anarchy when Uranus transits through a certain sector of our chart. So just make sure it's constructive and you're kind of like thinking things through as best as you can. All right, so those are the eclipses in your fourth and tenth house. Finally, the last transit I wanted to mention is the Mars retrograde period, where Mars is going to go retrograde in Gemini in the second half of the year in your 11th house of friends and groups and alliances. So this transit's really going to start in August, as soon as Mars ingresses into your 11th house of friends and groups. But it doesn't get intensified, it doesn't become fully operative until Mars actually stations retrograde in Gemini around October 30th. So Mars is going to go into your 11th house. Um, so the, the positive side of Mars, uh, especially for those of you with night charts where Mars tends to be more constructive is that it can be a period where you're putting more energy into something and it's just speeding up the pace of your interactions with friends and groups for a certain period of time for at least like six or seven months, starting from August going forward. So it could be a period where you're just working more with friends, you're getting more involved with groups, you're having to take more decisive action or even play some sort of initiating or leadership role when it comes to friends and groups. So the potential downside of this energy is that sometimes Mars can tend to heat things up and make them too hot so that we can become sort of like hot-headed or um, impulsive or impetuousness or even irritable during this time. So one of the potential downfalls or downsides you want to be careful for is not becoming overly irritable and not getting in fights or conflicts with friends or groups or social movements. So in some instances, if something is going weirdly and you have to say something and call things out, you know that can be necessary and constructive even if subjectively it might feel difficult or troublesome. So I'm not saying to don't do something if you need to, but uh, one of the things I would just point out as a potential downside for this is maybe speaking first or speaking off the top of your head and saying something in anger that you later regret that could cause some sort of falling out with a friend or a friend group or some allies that you otherwise work with closely and, and like and enjoy. So just be careful not to do anything that you regret later when it comes to friend groups. Um, But generally speaking, it should just be a period in which friends and alliances are more of the focus for you, um, especially once Mars slows down and stations at the end of October. And then 
part of that retrograde transit will continue on into next year and into early 2023. All right. So I think that's actually it because that's like the last major transit that I really wanted to flag for you for the purpose of this horoscope. So uh, good luck. Thanks for watching. And uh, I'll see you again next year for the horoscope for 2023. All right. That's it for this horoscope forecast for 2022. So as always, this was just a general forecast that focuses on some of the broad outlines of the year ahead. So if you'd like a more detailed analysis of some of the general transits this year, then be sure to check out our year ahead forecast for 2022 that we released in December. Uh, additionally, for a more detailed analysis of your chart, you might want to get a consultation with an astrologer because they can look at it in much more detail than I can go into here in just a general horoscope. Alternatively, or better yet, you could also learn how to read your birth chart and transits on your own which would allow you to pinpoint some of the dates involved with much more precision and exactness. So if you'd like to learn more about my approach to astrology, then you can get a copy of my book titled Hellenistic Astrology, The Study of Fate and Fortune. And in this book, I reconstructed the original system of Western astrology and recovered some techniques that we had lost uh, many centuries ago. So with this book, I sort of teach you how to read a birth chart and how to use different timing techniques in order to determine when different things will happen during the course of your life, or in some instances during the course of a single year, as I've attempted to do in this horoscope forecast. So the book is available on Amazon as well as in other fine bookstores everywhere. I also teach an online course on ancient astrology, which has over a hundred hours of video lectures. Uh, it shows hundreds of different example charts in order to show you how the different techniques work in practice, and it really gets into details that I couldn't go into as much in my book, even though the book is very big. Uh, in the course, I actually get into a lot more example charts, which really gives you better hands-on experience of how to use astrology to read birth charts in practice. So You can find out more information about that at courses.theastrologyschool.com. And finally, I also recently released my 2022 electional astrology report, where I went through the year and I picked out some of the most auspicious or lucky dates uh, with one lucky date or electional chart for each of the next 12 months. So these are useful for starting different types of ventures and undertakings using the principles of electional astrology. The report is also available at courses.theastrologyschool.com. All right, so that, that's it. So thanks for watching. Good luck in 2022, and may the stars be ever in your favor. A special thanks to all the patrons that supported the production of this episode of the podcast through our page on patreon.com. In particular, thanks to the patrons on our producers tier, including Thomas Miller, Catherine Conroy, Christy Moe, Ariana Amour, Mandy Ray, Angelique Nambo, Sumo Kopic, Issa Sabah, Jake Otero, Morgan McKinsey, and Kristen Otero. If you like the work that I'm doing here on the podcast and you would like to find a way to support it, then please consider becoming a patron through my page on patreon.com. And in exchange, you'll get access to bonus content such as early access to new episodes, the ability to attend the live recording of the month ahead forecast each month, access to a private monthly auspicious elections report that we put out each month, access to exclusive episodes that are only available for patrons, or you can also get your name listed in the credits at the end of each episode. For more information, go to patreon.com slash astrology podcast. The main software we use here on the podcast to look at astrological charts is called Solar Fire for Windows, which is available at alabe.com, and you can use the promo code AP15 to get a 15% discount. For Mac users, we use a similar set of software by the same programming team called AstroGold for Mac OS, which is available from astrogold.io, and you can use the promo code ASTROPODCAST15 to get a 15% discount on that as well. Also, special thanks to our sponsors, including the Mountain Astrologer magazine, which is available at mountainastrologer.com, the Honeycomb Collective Personal Astrological Almanacs, available at honeycomb.co, and the Astrogold Astrology app, which is available for both iPhone and Android at astrogold.io. There are also two major astrology conferences happening this year, 
The first is the Northwest Astrological Conference, happening May 26th through the 30th, 2022, near Seattle, Washington. Find out more information at norwac.net. And the second is the International Society for Astrological Research Conference, which is taking place August 25th through the 29th, 2022, in Westminster, Colorado. And you can find out more information about that at isar2022.org.